Maxwell's equations, Ampere's circuit law. We start with Ampere's experiment, and at a high level, we see magnetic fields circulating around moving charges. In this case, we have a wire passing a current, and we can observe a magnetic field around that. So you can imagine passing enough current through a wire and maybe punch that wire through a piece of paper, pour some metal filings on that piece of paper, and they'll line up and you can observe these magnetic field lines. So we know that this happens. We can measure it. It's bidirectional. Uh, so if we start with a current, if we have a static current, that will induce a static magnetic field circulating around that current. Now it works the other way, but it's a little bit different. If we started off and somehow caused the circulating magnetic field, but it was static, that would not induce a current. If that were the case, we could just take a magnet, sit it next to a wire, and then power the world. And it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, we need a time-changing magnetic field to induce the current. But otherwise, this phenomenon is bidirectional and works both ways. The other thing that we observe, the stronger the current, the stronger the magnetic field. And again, that would work both ways. If we started with the strong magnetic field, we'd get a stronger current. If we started with a stronger current, we'd get a stronger magnetic field. So the strength of the magnetic circulation in some way indicates and correlates to the strength of the current through the axis of that rotation. And so we can write an equation. If we do a line integral, adding up the total strength of the circulation of the magnetic field, if you will, that would give us the total and total current enclosed within that line integral. And this is also a concept we'll pick up again when we get to magnetostatics. So here we are, where anytime we have a current, we'll have a circulating magnetic field. We can write our total current another way and do a surface integral of the current density. And so if we integrate that over the cross section of the wire, we'll get our total current. But let's remember there are actually three types of current density, three types of electric current, and each one will produce a magnetic field because each is a current. So the total current density, remember, is the conduction current plus the convection current. And these two together are due to free charges. And that's what the J term in Maxwell's equations is. But there is a third current term, the displacement current. We won't write it as a J to not confuse it with the free charge J. We'll write it as the time derivative of the displacement field or the electric flux density. So we go back to our integral where we're integrating the total current density but now we have the free charge current density and the displacement current density that we're writing as the time derivative of electric flux density. So we put all these together and we can get the total current. Now we put all of this together. In Ampere's experiment, we did a line integral of the magnetic field around the axis of circulation and figured out that gives us the current through the axis of circulation. And we also have another way to get total current. We've, we integrated our three types of different currents, our conduction current, our convection current, and our displacement current. Since both of these approaches gives us the total current, we can set them equal. And when we do that, we arrive at Ampere's law in integral form. To get Ampere's law in differential form, we will apply Stokes' theorem. Remember what Stokes' theorem tells us. It's, it's a way to convert a closed contour line integral of A into a surface integral where we're integrating the curl of A. So in Ampere's circuit law, we had a closed contour line integral. So we can replace that with a surface integral where we have the curl of H now. So here we are with two surface integrals, and if the two surface integrals give us the same answer, that must mean that the arguments inside of those integrals are the same thing. So if we set those equal, 
we get Ampere's law in differential form. And it's telling us the curl of the magnetic field or the circulation of the magnetic field must have some kind of current through the axis of that circulation. And as I mentioned before, this is bidirectional. It works both ways. We can cause the current and that will induce a magnetic field or we can create the magnetic field first and that will produce the current. So we end this discussion with a visualization of Ampere's law in differential form. And I'm showing the two different terms separately, but they can happen at the same time and in any combination. So looking at just the curl of H equals J over here, we see the magnetic field circling around a current I. And then on the right, we have the circulation of H being set equal to the displacement current or the partial derivative of D with respect to time. We're visualizing that. So in the image to the right, we notice that the more quickly the D field is changing, we get a stronger magnetic field. Whereas on the left, the time rate of change of current really doesn't affect the magnitude of the magnetic field. It's just the magnitude of the current correlates to the magnitude of the electric field. Whereas for D, yes, stronger D field means stronger H, but also the more quickly the D field is changing, the stronger the H. That's because a very quickly changing D field means more current is flowing.